If y'all would turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, is where we'll start. Matthew 18, 21. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand and we will get one to you and it, you can keep it if you need one. We want you to have the Word of God and carry it around with you and, at all times. So if you need one, we've got them and we try to make sure we get large enough font that some of us can see them. All right. If y'all would, bow your heads if you found that place. Father, we want to thank you for allowing us to gather here to get today, Lord. And we want to thank you for the Malinowskis and all the service and the time and effort they've put in over all these the last several years that they've been here, Lord. And we ask you to bless them, keep them safe on their trip to Oklahoma, Lord, that they settle in uh, in your will, Lord, wherever you and whatever you have them doing there. Lord God, we just ask you to bless them and their four beautiful children, Lord, also. Thank you for the time we've had with them. Lord, may they feel welcome as they, and loved as they leave and welcome, Lord, uh, to come back if you so see fit. And Father, we ask you to anoint them and uh, all the needs we brought to, uh, to you with the announcements, Lord, and also the word here today, Father. And we just thank you for the opportunity once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, there was a, there's a story that goes, there was once this young little boy who was given his first slingshot. I remember getting mine. It wasn't the Cadillac model, the metal one that had the arm guard. and the. It, well, I didn't get that one. I got the wooden one, but it did have a little crosshair in the middle of it, which never seemed, it was always off. You know, mine was because I couldn't hit anything with it. Uh, but this little boy got his first slingshot, and uh, he did the same thing I did. Same thing when I remember I got my first Daisy Red Rider BB gun. Wandered the woods and the hills shooting anything that I could aim at. And uh, I think it was days before I ever hit anything other than a tree. But this little boy took, takes it out in the woods in order to practice with it. Same thing, shooting anything he sees. And he couldn't hit anything. Been out there for hours. He'd gone through a bunch of rocks and acres, whatever you want to put in there to shoot. Couldn't hit anything. So he's wandering back home to his grandmother's house, and as soon as he comes to the edge of the woods and gets in the yard, he sees there in the yard his grandmother's pet duck. And then in that childlike mindset, they all have, he has this brilliant idea, huh, I'll aim at the duck. And so he does. And breaking his bad record and not hitting anything, he hits the duck. Kills it, dead, right then. And then reality set in, and I've killed my grandmother's pet duck. So what does he do? He runs over there, and he scoops the thing up, and he goes and hides it behind a wood pile. Because he's a country boy like me, something will come get it that night. Coons, possums, dogs, something will come get it. And he thinks he's gotten away with this. And he looks up, and he's walking toward the house. He sees his sister. And she has that look that all sisters get. When they know they've got you, uh-huh, I got you. She doesn't say a word. So they go inside, and the grandmother fixes supper, and everybody's eating and talking, and everything's going on as normal. And then finally, <clears throat> the grandmother says, all right, sweetie, talking to the little girl, it's time to, you know, time to help me clean up. And she said, you know, uh, Bobby decided he really wanted to help with the dishes tonight. She looks at him and leans over. So he gets up and helps and does all the dishes. And the next day, he's supposed to go fishing with his grandfather. And he's getting ready. And the, the grandmother said, all right, talks to the little girl. She said, I need some help cleaning up, dusting, all this kind of stuff. And she said, you know what? Bobby decided he really wanted to help clean up today, Grandma. Oh, really? Yeah. And she looks over there at Bobby. Isn't that right? And so this goes on, and a little girl leaves with her grandfather and goes fishing for the rest of the day. And this goes on and on and on for some time. And finally, the little boy, Bob, he can't stand it anymore. I mean, he's, he's, he feels guilty, and at the, other time, at the same time, he's, his sister is really working him over on this. So he just sits in his room one night, and he says, i got to confess. And so he goes to his grandmother, and he tells her what, he do, what he's done. And she says, 
I know, because I saw you from the kitchen window. And I've already forgiven you. I was just wondering how long you were going to allow this, the guilt, and your sister to enslave you. And that's what unforgiveness does, is it, is it enslaves us. It is sin. It eats us up from the inside. And it dovetails right in with what we talked about last week in the first half of Matthew chapter 18, um, where the major theme was that of reconciliation. But you understand, in order for there to be reconciliation, uh, there's got to be forgiveness. And Jesus last week gave some very practical steps to take in bringing about reconciliation and going to the person, confronting them, and love and grace and, and, and about them stumbling us in one way or another. He gave some very practical things, steps to take in how to deal with that. And now as we pick up the second half of the chapter, Jesus is going to use a question asked him by Peter to drive the point home, but also to show the bigger picture. All right, because when it comes to forgiveness, we all latch on to the idea, but we usually only go so far with whom we uh, forgive or, or how long we're willing to forgive or how far we go with that. So, look at uh, Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to start in verse 21. It says, and this is only here. Now, there's a lot of stuff been going on. Now, they, the, the disciples, this comes right on the heels of, Lord, we know you're about to die and you've got to go and all that. Which of us is going to be the man? when you leave. And so there, I think there's a little bit of, all, when Peter, Peter always puts his foot in his mouth, he comes up and, and he, I think he's jockeying for position. And we'll see that by what he says, I think. Lord, how often must I forgive? Look at this question. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And if you know what this means, I can almost see a little smug smile on Peter's face. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And Peter, I can see him going. And then he's looking around, who else heard this? Now, it's crucial to remember this question, like as I said, it comes on the heels of Jesus' instructions on reconciliation, humility, forgiveness, those sorts of things, because all of those things go together. It's almost a perfect triangle. If you've ever seen a diagram of a, fire triangle. You've got to have a fuel, oxygen, and I think an ignition source. It's been a long time since I've seen one, but I know there are three things you've got to have to start a fire. You remove any one of the three and the fire ceases to be. It's the same thing here. You've got to, there's got to be reconciliation, humility, and forgiveness. They all go together. But this question shows Peter's state of mind, and I'd venture to say that to most of us, this is a practical question. How long? Have I got to keep forgiving this person? You know, because it always comes up. It's one thing if someone does something, you forgive them, and then it goes on. But sometimes there are things that continually happen. And everybody wants to know, how long have I got to keep on with this? How long are we to let people just walk over us and take advantage of us? And that's where the real rub is, I think, because none of us like feeling like we've been, someone's gotten over on us, you know. You fool me once, shame on me. You fool me, you know, shame on you. You fool me twice, shame on me. That sort of attitude. And nobody, they're not going to get over on me. Uh uh uh. And that's when we rooster up and pride comes in. And no, they're not getting over on me again. And that, you got to understand, once we get into that mindset, we have lost sight of what forgiveness and the kingdom of God is all about. And as I said last week, Jesus answered very practically how we are to approach those who stumble us or even continually stumble us and try to work out the problem. But Peter seems to not have, in, you know, like he normally does, not totally gotten it. He kind of deflects here. And, uh, he's in, and the whole question has come back now to him. Now he's asking about somebody else, but the, the focus really underlying this thing is him, is Peter. In his mind, forgiveness can be the thing that allows somebody to get away with something. But that's the wrong way to look at it, as we'll see later. Now, Peter asked Jesus, how many times am I for, to forgive him? Seven times enough? And we think, you know, what does that mean? Well, you've got to understand the context. Because the rabbis taught, this was the common thing. If you'd asked anybody in the culture, how often do you to... How many times are you to forgive someone? They was, the rabbis would have said straight up, three. 
After that, you can smoke him. I've forgiven him three times. You, you ask me, I hope you come to me again. That was what the rabbis taught. After three times, hey, you don't have to forgive him anymore. So when Peter says, how many times, Lord? Seven? In his mind, hey, I'm going above and beyond. I want him to go twice as many as the rabbis and one more to get at that nice round number of seven, standing for perfection and completion in the Hebrew mind and this sort of thing. How many times? Seven? Go ahead. Give me the accolades, Lord. I want to go further than anybody else. And then, as usual, when Peter is sitting there so sure of himself as he has stepped forward and answered the question, and, and, and once again, this comes on the heels of who is going to be the man? Because I'm willing to forgive him seven times. Seven. And when you're around a jet and you've got to give numbers because the jet's the engine's going and you need three, four, five. Once you get past five, it's is six, this is seven, this is eight. So Jesus, I mean, Peter goes, And Jesus, you know, I'm sure he didn't even bat an eye. He probably just looked, no, not seven. Seventy times seven. And Peter, as well as anybody else, any rabbis with an earshot, I'm sure, seventy times seven. Now, I'm a recovering graduate of the Mississippi Public School System, but I do understand that that number equals 490. And so at face value, we would say, 490 times, and then I can smoke him. Then I can slug the guy. But, you know, Jesus knows, especially with guys, they're not going to count that long. They're not going to count. There's too many to count. And this is per person now. You might even mark the argument that it, make the argument that it's 490 times per the same issue. So, I mean, if they steal your golf cart, then you got 490 times to forgive them of that. If they... Step on your golf ball, as some people have been known to do, <laughs> because you're beating them, or not. It really doesn't matter. We're going to step on it and run over it with a golf cart and do, anyway. But the point is, if something else, then you got 490 times before you can stop for that one offense. So you got this. And then here's the deal. I'm thinking, knowing how I am, I can't remember what the date is, let alone, all right, I forgive him again. That's 200 and. All right, we'll call it 250. You know, you're going to lose count. But that's not, that's not even it. The, Jesus gives him a, a, just this exorbitant number. But also, that number 7 or 70, as I said, it, in, the, in biblical terms, generally means completion or perfection biblical numerology, and you can make a lot more of numbers than it needs to be, but the, that general concept is within the Bible, completion or perfection. And then and, uh, practically, it's just a large number to have to, rem to remember to, to uh, forgive someone. But then it goes further than that if you're familiar with eschatology and Bible prophecy, then it's a prophetic number. There are 77 in Daniel's prophecy, 70 weeks of years, that means 490 years. Israel was in exile 70 years in Babylon. So you take those numbers, you start looking what, at what they mean to the Hebrew mind, they automatically hyperlink to judgment, prophecy, that sort of thing, this prophetic number that always represents God's long-suffering with Israel. And so they automatically come back to this, how long God has put up with Israel, no matter how bad their behavior. And now we start to get the backstory, the background of, of, all, of this total thing about forgiveness. And then Jesus tells a story to illustrate the point, using large numbers once again, and you, if you're just reading it in your translation, you don't even get probably how large the numbers are. Look at this. So Jesus... Till 70 times 7, seven 70 times 7, 490. Then all of a sudden the gears start turning in the Hebrew mind, linking to all these prophetic dates and this perfection and, and completion and all this. And, and that is over, if that's not overwhelming enough, Jesus, probably without even batting an eye or takes, taking a breath, comes in right behind it. Let me tell you a story, Peter, to illustrate this. Verse 23. 
Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master, the king, commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him, and that doesn't mean he's praying for him. He grabbed a holt of him, put him in a headlock, you know, laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me and I'll pay you all. And he would not. And he wouldn't forgive it. But went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Now, back then, they didn't have bankruptcy court and all that sort of thing. If you wound up owing someone money and could not pay, then that you became their servant and you worked off the debt. Depending on what you did, whether you're cleaning the fence row or painting the house, or maybe you, you know, you can fix their computers or something, whatever the case may be, depending on your service rendered, that goes towards your debt. If you didn't have any special skill, you normally were paid the common day laborer's wage, which was a denarii, which is kind of the minimum wage of the day. All right? Well, this fellow owed the king ten thousand talents how much is that well I'm going to put it in US dollars for you here in just a second but to kind of put it in a larger perspective according to Josephus the tax revenue taken from all of the region of Palestine during in, in, in one year for uh, in, uh, in that first century was 800 talents all right so this guy owes a lot more than that. I was trying to do the math in my head. It's not going to work. More than 10 times that much. Then all of the revenue taken in from the entire land of Palestine. In today's money, 10,000 talents is upwards of $60 million. There are very few, we know, you know, Gates, Trump, um, Warren Buffett, they might can write a check like that. But for the rest of us, it ain't going to happen. Now, as I said, a denarii was one day's wage for the common laborer. You know, you go on to the corner and, hey, I need some guys to work on the farm. At the end of the day, they're going to get a denarii. It was a sort of, as I said, the minimum wage of the day. So this man, if he's being paid, if his debt's coming off a denarii a day at the time, what this is equivalent to, it's going to take him 150,000 years to pay off that debt. If he paid him everything he ever took in, doesn't take anything, doesn't take any of the money to eat on or to feed his wife and kids, buy clothes, anything. If as soon as he gets it, it goes right to that person. It's kind of how it works at my house. It goes right to that person and they never see it themselves. Take 150,000 years to pay off the debt. Who can ever pay off that debt? It's impossible. It's doubtful that the debt would have been recouped, even if you have to understand when the king says, all right, I'm going to send you and we're going to sell you as you and your family off, and I know the connotation that brings up, but that was, it wasn't the sort of what's called cattle or chattel slavery that, was, uh, that happened here in the States, in America, the um, last few hundred years. It wasn't like that, but you were sold into servitude into another family. Now, you had rights, and you could leave after a certain all that goes on in the laws of Israel at, in the Jubilee year, your debt would be forgiven anyway. But at this point, there's no way he can work this off. Even if the, his, his wife, children, everything, his house, his cars, everything he has is sold off, it's just a write-off to the king. He's not going to recoup this debt. But the king had compassion on him, and he just wrote it off. Who could write off or absorb a debt like that? This king did, and you have to understand that. Don't fall into this mindset of the young people today that they got plenty of money, so it's not costing them anything. Wrong. There's always a debt. Somebody is going to absorb the debt. 
Even if they write it off, you crash their car and they go, well, you know, I know you can't pay me back, I'll take it. They're still out the car. No matter if they got a million dollars in the bank or not. Someone is absorbing the debt and this king was absorbing the debt. But then that man who was absolved of the debt went to collect what was owed him, which it says was a hundred denarii. Now, and in today's money, that's roughly, I mean, this is figuring for inflation, about 60 bucks. He's been forgiven a debt of over $60 million. He goes to see someone that owes him 60 bucks. I don't know. I mean, I've got people that owe me money. I, I was, you know, kind of right. Daddy always told me, he said, as long as somebody owes you money, you'll never be broke. I'm not broke. I got kids. <laughs> I'll never be broke. And I owe my dad money, so he'll never be broke either. You know, that's just the way it goes. Uh, but this man was forgiven $60 million worth of debt, and then he, oh, thank you, and he runs out, and you owe me 60 bucks. Pay up. I can't. Boom, boom, boom. Chokes him and all this. And so he, he's not going to forgive the debt. So there's no grace there. He goes, files papers, and has a man thrown into debtor's prison. And he's going to have to stay there a particular time or, or turn around and try to work off the debt. It's kind of the way some people are, aren't they? Look at verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him and said, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So what we see here is some fellow servants intervene. They saw all this. Unforgiveness does not go unnoticed. You might think it does. You might think we got it all going on on the down low, as they say. But it doesn't go unnoticed, either by, neither by God nor those around us. And you say, how is that? Because it eats us up from the inside. It, it cannot not have an effect on us, and thereby, because it has effect on, an effect on us, the law of the butterfly effect, uh, means that it's going to have an effect on those around us. It poisons the very atmosphere not to mention our own hearts. And bitterness begins to manifest. It takes over our lives. It enslaves us. You, you, I, this, I don't know if this is the greatest example or not, but you think of Ebenezer Scrooge in the story, and no, that's not my real name, is Ebenezer. Everybody asks that. No, there's not even a B in my real name. But think of how angry and bitter and how miserly he was, and his problem was money. But he was just an angry, bitter person, and it shone through all that he did. I have a, I've seen a ministry wrecked by this very thing because the pastor just could not, he got hurt and became bitter and carried it around with him like a weight. And it just it wrecked him from the inside out. I mean, it is totally disrupted. He's still pastoring, but it's still it's totally disrupted everything around him. It's just like this green, ugly, green, foul cloud that goes everywhere with him. It enslaves us. It takes over our lives in some way. I, Pastor Chuck was talking about, he was somewhere, he and Kay, and um, they were... Um, we're talking to this man whose wife had left him 25 years prior with an evangelist, a foreign evangelist. And, of course, you know what that meant. He hated every preacher he ever saw after that. And he's mad and he hated women and you can't trust them and blah, blah, blah. And Chuck said this guy just went on and on. He spent a whole day with him. And that's all he talked about was his wife and this guy 25 years ago. Now, that's a big hit. I get it. And it's, it's crushing to anybody's life, but 25 years. Chuck finally, if you know Chuck, he was a gracious man. Chuck finally said, dude, you got to let this go. you got to let it go. You're sitting here miserable and have been for 25 years, and she and him, if they're still together, <laughs> they're living it up. The only one suffering from this is you. And that's what forgiveness is about. It does not absolve anyone of responsibility. 
person that you're forgiving. It doesn't absolve them, but it keeps the acid from mounting up in you and killing you and eating you alive. And this guy, you see that this man who um, the, uh, that was forgiven the debt but wouldn't forgive uh, someone else, even a very small debt, is eating him alive. As he can't even enjoy the fact that he's somebody cut a check and he no longer has any debt. He can't even enjoy it. He goes right into, I'm going to get you mode. And do you know what? Everybody else saw it. He didn't. And that's the way sin slips up on us too, because we don't see it. He wasn't aware of it. I'm sure he kind of was aware, all right, I'm going to get this guy, but he's not really aware of what it's doing. I'm sure he's not aware of how it even changed his countenance on his face or his attitude. Him, I'm going to take care of business now. I've got this off of me. I've got this off my shoulders. Now I can deal with my own problem, my other problems. And he goes and he's not even aware of his hypocrisy. And many times we are the same way. You know, last week we talked about offenses. And like I said, we're not talking about someone offended me. We're talking about stumbling blocks. And you know, I've been doing this a long time. And there's... Even if I'm up here and trying to be sweeter than Jesus, I've learned I'm still going to make somebody mad. I'm going to offend somebody. And it's not even within these four walls because this is on the Internet. (laughs) You get feedback from that too. They might be in Peoria, Illinois. I can't believe you said that. What in the world? You know, and that's the thing. Due to insensitivities or even something being taken wrong, we're going to upset somebody at some given time. It's going to happen. Jesus made people mad, and nobody loved more than Jesus. That's why they killed him. He made them mad. That sort of thing happens. So through our, we do have blind spots, and through our insensitivity sometimes, or just not paying attention, or something being taken wrong, we can cause stumbling blocks. But, and and people say stuff that it kind of upsets me. Now, I'm not easily offended. I really am not. I have a superpower called apathy. You know, and obliviousness. Oblivion, you know, I could, I don't, they can be almost cussing me out, and I don't even, I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't know. Is that what they're doing? Didn't pay any attention. I had that superpower, and in that sense, it's good most of the time. But, um, you know, when somebody I know says something like that, you know what? I go, I know them. I got a track record. They're having a bad day. It doesn't bother me at all. Just, yeah, give them the benefit of the doubt. That's what love does, all right? You just give them the benefit of the doubt. But this guy's not even aware of this. Other people are. We have blind spots, and many times we aren't even aware of having offended anyone, so we have to check ourselves. And if you do go, mm, that didn't come out right, you know, I apologize. Please, I, I didn't mean it that way. Go and take care of it. One thing I want you to see in this is the wicked servant wasn't considered wicked because he had owed money to the king and failed to pay. That wasn't even held against him. But he is considered wicked. Wicked enough to be delivered to the tormentors, which all I can think of, you know, the first thing that pops into my head is those guys in a black mask with a mace, you know, carrying you to the torture chamber and they're, you know, strap you to something and flog you, you know. 30 lashes or something. That's what I think about the tormentor, the guy that runs the torture chamber. And he's going to be in there while he while he's, uh, pays the debt. And here's the thing. He's going to be there a long time. You know why? There's no way on God's green earth he can pay back 60 plus million dollars when he makes a denarii a day. It's just not going to happen. You, you can work at every McDonald's at the same time you want to and you're not going to be able to pay back 60 million dollars a day. That is this guy's plight. And now he's being delivered to the uh, tormentors. He, he was wicked because he failed to forgive as he had been forgiven. Look at Matthew 6, 12. We went over this some time ago. In the Lord's Prayer, as it's called, and toward the end it says, Forgive us our debts as we forget our, forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. He didn't do that. That's what's so wicked. That. It was his lack of giving what he had what uh, he had received that made him wicked. It was his failure to appreciate the grace and then reciprocate that gift that made him wicked. Look at the, uh, different, look at the differences, the difference in the amounts owed by this man and to what was owed to him. Tens of millions compared to less than $100. And 
And that is the point here. That large difference, this is a humongous number by what even in our day, 60 bucks, most of us can come up with 60. We might not have it in our hands. We can come up with it if we had to. If you had to, you can go get it from somewhere. That's a paltry number. And that's the point. How can we hope to work off a debt of unrighteousness to, to repay a just and holy God? That's what this thing comes down to. A just and holy God. A God that is so holy and so just that even the thought of, you know, that's not my paper clip. But I could sure use one at the house. Even the thought of that, something we go, <sighs> To a holy God. And that's hard for us to get because we are not holy. We have to be made holy. His righteousness has to be imputed or given to us, stuck to us. Even the thought of that paperclip is just evil. It is you take whatever you believe is the worst crime in the world, serial killing, rapes, or whatever, mass atrocities, Hitler, whatever you think is the worst conceivable thing on this earth. The paperclip is the equivalent to that in the eyes of God. That's how holy he is. That is the standard. But we don't even think of it that way so, so many times because our sin, we can fall into this bad trap of our sin and then the concept of forgiveness, it can become, those things can become little more than a theological concept. Oh yeah, sin, God forgave me. Cool, man. What's up? What's next? ESPN? You know, that's, that's, if it, if it gets placed, it gets filed in our mind somewhere is, is theological and, you know, that's kind of what preachers talk about. Yeah, I get the gist of it. And we go on about that. And that, but this, that very reason, because we can easily place it in that category, this is why Jesus uses money in the parable, because we can all relate. Because I'm here to tell you, after 30 years in ministry, I know this, the last thing to get saved on a person is their pocketbook. We're going to hold on to our money. That's just the way it is. And so Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to make sure this is a universal lesson because we all understand money. We all understand that. We can all relate to that. This debt, this $60 million debt that doesn't go away in the sense that someone has to absorb it. It doesn't just go bloop and it's not there anymore. The king that wrote off the debt absorbed that. He lost $60 million. You might say, well, he's got 100 gazillion, so it doesn't matter. It's not the way to look at it. He is absorbing a loss. Someone always does. I use the example of, of you know, uh, I borrow a baker's lawnmower or something, and I take it and I break it. And then I bring it, take it back to him. Hey, man, I just quit running. Uh, and when I hit that stump, it, something happened. It just shattered. And, you know, I can just... You know, you can push it back in his garage and leave before he has time to see it. Or, um, you know, you can tell him, and he, and he has the authority, since it's his, he can say, uh, don't worry about it. Or he could say, well, you need to pay for it. Well, if I need to pay for it, I've got to go replace it with something of equal or greater value. Now, whatever that is, say it's $500. Well, if he says, don't worry about it, it's not like he's not out anything. He's still got to replace the loan more. So now he's out $500. Money just doesn't just cease to be. There's always a debt somewhere. somewhere. Very basic economics. We learned that in uh, school. Somebody always has to absorb the debt. And so if we see things the way God sees them, which is one of the definitions for repentance, is to see our sin as God sees it, then we honestly should see the debt. Even if we can't even wrap our minds totally around the debt, when, that's why I gave you the, the paper clip story. To see how, or hopefully to paint a picture of just how holy God is. Now, we've received forgiveness. Forgot that was there. Therefore, we're bound to give it. But it's like this story I, I've told, I've probably told, I'm at the point now I tell the same stories, you know, and I don't ever remember them. Um, these two fellas are walking along the road talking to each other, and one of them says, hey, man, if you had two horses, would you give me one? Oh, yeah, man. You know if I had two horses, I'd give you one of them? I appreciate it. They keep walking. The man says, hey, man, if you had a 
you had two good hunting dogs, would you give me one of them? The guy said, man, if I had two good hunting dogs, I'd give you one of them. Oh, man, you're a real pal, all this sort of stuff. So finally he walks along, he says, hey, man, if you had two good hogs, would you give me? And his buddy stopped and said, come on now, you know I got two hogs. We're willing to give what we haven't got. Man, if I had that, I'd give it to you. That's easy. But that, see, that's the problem. When it comes to forgiveness, we have it. If you're a child of God or a believer, you have it. You can't say, oh, come on, man, if I had forgiveness, I'd give it to you. I'd forgive you. if I. But we've been forgiven. And then in the story, we've been forgiven a debt of 60 gazillion dollars. And then when someone comes over, or they wrong us, or they said something about us, they hurt our feelings, or whatever, it's equal to 5 or $10. But we've received 60 gazillion dollars worth of forgiveness. Therefore, we have it to give back. And it's the right thing to do, is to reciprocate. We've received it, therefore we're bound to give it. Jesus takes unforgiveness very seriously. You know, because, you know why? Because He's in the forgiving business. The whole basis of, the, you know, of salvation is based on that. Look at verse 35. This is how serious he takes it. He says, my, so my heavenly Father also will do to you, speaking of the tormentors, which is allegorical form of hell. And I don't know if you've got folks flogging you with you know, stuff. I don't think that's the way it works, but you get the picture. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses and link this back with what we talked about last week. Put simply, if we have truly understood what God has done for us and how much even the smallest sin flies in the face of a holy God, then there's no way we can downplay the importance of forgiveness because we have been absolved of that great debt. That's the point to Peter as well as all of us, that there's no limit uh, to how we are to forgive when we have been forgiven of so much. I don't know how many of y'all have ever heard of the lady Corey Ten Boom. Her name was thrown around when I was growing up. We had all, I didn't know who she was at the time, but you hear those names, Lottie Moon, Corey Ten Boom, and all these people. But she was from the Netherlands when the Germans invaded in 1940. And at first she's trying to help Jews and other people escape the Nazis. Eventually, her whole family is taken captive. And um, a couple of things happened. One was before she was taken captive, she had a man come to her and he, he, said, um, he said, the Nazis, there are 100 babies over in this facility, and the Nazis are going to kill all of them because they're all Jewish. But there's a sympathetic Gestapo guy, policeman, Nazi, that if we give him... 600, whatever their currency, I'm going to say Deutschmarks, but that's not what it was. 600 Deut Deutschmarks or whatever. If we give him this, then he'll see to it, and he'll leave a door unlocked or something, and we can come get all the baby, and they'll be taken care of. So Corey Ten Boone says, come back and see me in an hour. True story now. She goes to everyone she knows and starts, tells them the story and gets as much money as she can, and an hour or so later, the guy comes back, and she said, here it is, 600 whatever. Well, and she thinks everything's going groovy, you know. Well, she finds out later, that guy, was in the, he was not sympathetic. One, he just robbed her and all those people of money, but those children weren't saved. And he was trying to figure out her place in the resistance. And this eventually led to her capture. So she said even after she was captured, she just, for years, she had harbored resentment and bitterness toward this guy because it, her father went in to the camps and died. Her sister went into the camps and died. Her brother came out of the camps but died due to an illness he contracted in the, in the, the camps and all this, and she, she made it out, if you know her story. But the problem is she had harbored this bitterness this whole time. And then eventually, when the Nuremberg trials came up some, at some point, she heard that that guy who had conned her out of the $600 was going to be sentenced to death. So she wrote him a letter and told him all of the stuff that went on. She said, but I can't go without forgiving you, um, knowing that you're soon to die. 
And she sent him a Bible with a letter. And the man read the Bible, and he wrote her a letter back shortly before he died, was, was executed. He said, thank you, that, first of all, that you're willing to give me, forgive me the way that Christ has forgiven us. And thank you for the Bible, because now I see that even someone such as I can be forgiven, and I can go to my death knowing that I'll be with Christ forever. Later on, Corey Ten Boom was at some sort of ceremony and a man came up to her and she recognized him as one of the concentration camp guards. And he stuck out his hand. And at first, she didn't know what to do. She eventually shook his hand. And he began crying and said, I ask you to forgive me for all those things. And she did. Now, I use that. Just as I told you a week or so ago about the civil rights crime, the, the, the murder of, the, of uh, the two young black men in 1964 back home where I'm from, how the brother of one of those men tracked down one of the Klansmen and eventually got to know him, forgave him, and even went to church with him. Somebody that brutally murdered and then chained his brother's body to a jeep engine and dumped him in the Mississippi River. Horrible death. He was willing to put that behind him. He said he had to because it had eaten him alive since 1964. This happened, I think, in 2005, I think, is when that happened. It ate him alive. So think about it this way. If someone came and wrote you a check, it covered all your outstanding debt. I'm going back to money so we can all relate. Even though us people like me don't have any, you can still relate to it. If someone came and wrote a check that covered all your outstanding debts as well as placing an even greater sum in some sort of trust fund that would allow you to live comfortably, uh, as comfortably as the wealthiest person in the world so that you no longer had to work, which that's what most of us are thinking about, right? I mean, if I just had a million dollars in trust fund, I could just play golf all day. If you have any drive in you at all, you would go crazy if you don't have a purpose. But if, they, if someone did that, would you then serve them or thank them? Would it not be constantly on your mind? Would you appreciate what that person had done for you? Of course you would. Well, that's the situation in which the believer finds him or herself. So, when you're tempted to hold a grudge and not forgive someone, think of being given millions of dollars or being forgiven millions of dollars of debt, and see that the person whom you begrudge owes you just a couple of dollars in comparison. Think of Corey Ten Boom, the grandmother with a pet duck, or even Thomas More who forgave the Klansman who killed his brother and one other young man in that same incident. Because if you want to recover the, all the precious sleep, the years lost to some abuse you may have suffered as a child, you want to recover those things. Forgiveness is the only way to do it. And with that comes the peace. And the only way to do that is the peace in the kingdom of God. That's the only way there is to it. That's all there is. What I really want you to leave, that's one thing between one another. But in order to, to be able to, because I can tell you, you just need to forgive those folks. We don't have it within us to just do that. Our sin nature, our Adamic nature says, no, I'm not. It's about me. What about me? Why did they get off scot-free? They don't. They don't. What about me? It's not about that. All you can think about is see that we've been forgiven gazillions of dollars worth of debt by a holy God that even a paper, the thought of a paperclip is, the most is equal to the most atrocious thing we can even imagine. And that debt's been written off. Not only what we've done in the past if we're believers, but the stupid things we're going to do in the future. Many of them, when we leave here and get into Atlanta traffic. So next time somebody owes you a couple of bucks, as it were, remember the gazillion dollar check that Jesus wrote for us. That's a God I can serve. That's a God that eliminates guilt. That's a God that takes our sin debt is willing to forgive and forgive 70 times 7, you know, however you want to extrapolate the numbers. Would you all bow your heads, please? Lord God, we know you're in the forgiving business.
And because of that, because of what you've given and what we as believers have received, or we are to reciprocate. We can't give what we don't have or what we haven't received, but we can give and we should even are commanded to give that which we have already received. And that is an unlimitless supply of forgiveness based out of love. Lord, the only thing that's going to override our human nature and the fact that we don't want to be gotten over on by someone is the fact of your agape love and your forgiveness. And when that becomes part of us and we truly appreciate the sin for which we've been forgiven, Lord, and we take it off the shelf and out of the box of theology and place it into what someone would call real life, Lord, practical pragmatic issues it totally changes our lives so Lord I'm asking that all those debts we've harbored and grudges Lord that um, you would empower us to let go of them just let go of the rope Lord that we would be free we no longer be slaves to those things and thereby empowered to live a victorious life Lord that you'd give us the power and the grace, the ability to go to that person and say, look, I forgive you. It's not a problem. And then, Lord, we'll see when the tears start rolling and the relationship is restored, we'll, we'll then experience even, even greater healing. Lord, it just, it just removes so much weight from our shoulders. And if we can truly appreciate the debt you have already removed from our shoulders, what an empowering thing that is. And we want to thank you for it, Lord. And God, let it never, let us never think flippantly of it. Help us to appreciate it, Father. And help us to apply it and to seek it, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.